I spoke about the Diageo, like just like beating a dead horse um, yeah. in like in the video that kind of inspired this podcast. Hey, welcome to Super Social Club. I'm Jeremy. This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Welcome to the Whiskey Ramp podcast. It's a little crusty. It's frustrating. And it's going to be a little bit of a rant. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Some sort of injustice. Anyway, and rant. Hello and welcome back to the Whiskey Ramp podcast. I'm Jeremy. I'm Rob. And tonight we are talking about gimmicky whiskeys, what that means. Uh, we've got the Glenmorangie cake in front of us tonight. Uh, celebrity whiskeys, gimmicky whiskeys, we're going to talk about it all. Um, I guess we should kind of start with what we think a gimmicky whiskey is. What's like our definition of what we mean by gimmicky whiskey? Yeah, so it's, it's a whiskey that basically can't sell itself, right? Or at least that's the presumption. Like you need some sort of flashy name, flashy person behind it in order to get it sold, right? Yeah, I think so. I think it's something that uh, the whiskey itself is not the main focus of the selling point, right? There's some kind of marketing involved that's outside the realm of what you're actually getting in the bottle. Um, okay. So that obviously there's this Glenmorangie cake, which I think is one of the most gimmicky Scotch whiskeys uh, we've seen in a very long time. Um, of course, there's celebrity backed uh, alcohols as well. Um, and then there's this other kind of category that we were talking about. And it's kind of like this hybrid where it's like, um, I think a great example is the Highland Park twisted tattoo. So you've got Highland Park with this whole kind of Viking marketing uh, direction they're putting in, which is gimmicky in itself. Uh, the twisted tattoo, obviously a very gimmicky type of name, but yeah. They're yeah. giving you all this information. So it kind of makes it, yes, the name's gimmicky. Yes, the bottle's gimmicky, but you still get an age statement. You still get the exact cask maturation. You know exactly what you're getting with that yeah. bottle versus something like this Glenmorangie like cake, where it's just essentially telling you this tastes like cake and that's why you should buy it. Yeah, I think with Highland Park, they almost get a pass because everything they do is somewhat gimmicky, right? Like you have that whole Viking... Uh, like expression line like all everything's viking something you know what i mean there's the odin the all those ones right like highland park just kind of loves the gimmicky theme but they they back their whiskeys with quality too like they're not just putting out crap giving it a fancy name and expecting people to buy it they're putting out good stuff i think people would prefer them not to do all these fancy like gimmicky style names but at the end of the day, that's part of who they are and really all the power to them for it because they're still making great stuff. They're one of the OGs that are still banging out like good product, in my opinion. So, Yeah, so they're kind of in the hybrid category, uh, but let's talk about this Glenmorangie cake. Um, so this thing came out, um, what, late 2020, early 2021? I can't really remember. Yeah, something like that. And there was a lot of buzz about it. People were like, oh, yeah, it smells and tastes like cake. Uh, I mean, this is my first time with it. Um, and I'm not getting any cake on the nose. Maybe a little bit of like a <laughs> vanilla note. We'll get into our notes. But essentially, this is a non-age statement whiskey. Uh, it's bottled at 46%. Uh, it's matured in these toke or toke dessert oh. wine casks, which is a white wine from uh, Hungary. Hungary. Yeah. Um, so dessert wine, uh, we're familiar with dessert wine in Ontario. We get lots of ice wine uh, stuff here where essentially they harvest the grapes while they're uh, somewhat frozen in the wintertime. Uh, yeah. It makes for a very sweet, very viscous, syrupy type of type of wine. Yeah. Um, so there's been some some uh, dessert wine, ice wine, cast maturation whiskey in Canada. Um, it never really translated to something like super awesome to me. I don't think that's why a lot of places don't use them all the time. But yeah, I think all, most of way. those are most of those are a bust for me. Like the so turns, like the some of those, you know, they're it's really the fortified wines that do well when whiskey's aged in them or whatever right so like right. obviously your olorosos your px the sherry umbrella the port umbrella even marsala has some decent ones um but i mean i don't know I, i'm not a big fan of these fancy wine casks glenn Morangy does something like this every year though right they're, they're kind of pumping out some sort of 
I don't want to call it as gimmicky as this, but there's a, a fancy expression almost every single year, isn't there? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know what? Like Glenborngy is a distillery that I don't necessarily uh, go to on that much of an occasion. I don't even own a single Glenborngy except for this. I do have a Signet, um, which I've reviewed before. Um, but the profile of this distillery, uh, very light, uh, something that doesn't fit with my palate too, too much. So I don't really purchase a lot of Glenmorgie stuff. I don't follow them too, too much, to be honest with you. Yeah. My brother had gifted me a bottle of the Milchen, the, the one that looks like a old school oh. candy shop. Mm -hmm. um, so that one, I mean, same idea. That was supposed to be very sweet, uh, candy themed, and it, it fell short for me. They, they all kind of do, yeah. uh, you know, I've had a couple of their main expressions that were decent. I found like, you know, their port cask, their sherry cask, they're decent and they're well-priced. But other than that, I'm not really too crazy about Glen Orangey. Yeah. I mean, their, their core range, the 12 year old, the 14 year old uh, cask finishes, they're okay. Yeah. Um, but again, that profile super light, uh, very delicate kind of whiskey. Yeah. I now, think that's kind of what you're getting here a little bit as well. Yeah. Like, I mean, so what, let's talk gimmicky whiskeys that have come out in the past. You got that whole Game of Thrones line, mm -hmm. which you, you had a funny story about the Game of Thrones line. Like if anybody hasn't watched my Game of Thrones line uh, video, I did the entire Game of Thrones lineup when they came out with all those whiskeys. Diageo did it. And I spent a lot of money to get those bottles. Like nothing, nothing over retail, but still it was there, you know, it cost me about a thousand bucks to do that video. And it flopped mainly because the show flopped. Um, but I didn't plan on collecting them because I felt like too many people were going to do that. So I didn't know how well it would increase in value. And you have a funny story about that. Yeah, well, just the, with the Game of Thrones stuff, um, I did review a couple of them, like the uh, uh, the Talisker, the um, Lagavulin, the ones that had a comparable comparison to their core range and kind of compared the two and my opinions on whether they were, you know, lived up to the core range equivalent or not. Uh, so you can check out those reviews on my channel. But yeah, like there was a mad dash to get these bottles when they first came out. And in our market anyway, they were selling them you know, uh, individually. And then they came out with the entire set. So then you could buy a set of them, they, they all eight or whatever it was. Um, and yeah, lots of hype around them. People were going crazy to get these. And yeah, you're right. Like people were collecting these uh, for collection purposes. Yeah. And I don't know how many, I tried to find the numbers on how many bottles were released. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's safe to assume in the hundreds of thousands, if not maybe like a half million or so, uh, knowing Diageo, knowing how much uh, product they can put out. Um, if you look at auction prices for these at the peak in 2019, there was a set selling for upwards of 2000 British pounds on a UK auction site. You look at what they sell for now, not even the retail price, 250 pounds uh, at a recent auction for the entire set. So people are losing their shirts on yeah. this stuff and i think you're right i think that as soon as people saw the finale of that show that set just diminished hugely the interest in game of thrones went way down it left a sour note in a lot of people's mouths and i think it affected the price of that whiskey yeah it's it's crazy how quickly that that show basically like all kinds of stuff was being pumped out um related to game of thrones because there was so much hype and then I don't think fans have ever been more let down uh, about a show. Yeah. So I honestly feel like it destroyed the entire um, merchandise, like collector item, like everything that was involved with Game of Thrones just plummeted in, in value. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens when the next uh, Game of Thrones series is released. The, I think it's the Targaryens, right? They're going back and doing yeah. uh, the Targaryens back uh, more kind of an origin story about that family, which which would be interesting. Um, I'm looking we'll, forward to it. I'll yeah, we'll see if we'll see if Diageo wants to do another release of whiskeys or not. I hope um, not. I, I hope, hope not as well. I think that was in like 
I spoke about the Diageo, like just like beating a dead horse um, yeah. in like in the video that kind of inspired this podcast <laughs> when I went nuts about everything, like because I was so crusty because I was coming off a dry month. Enough with the Game of Thrones whiskeys. You had your run, but just like the show, these bottles don't end well. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see what Diageo wants to do. But yeah, that Game of Thrones collection. I mean, I know there's so many people sitting on that collection right now. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. the whiskey itself, in my opinion, for the ones that I reviewed, were not as good as the core range equivalent. You know, the Lagavulin eight-year-old that comes out uh, is better than that Lagavulin nine-year-old. The Talisker 10 is better than that Talisker nine or whatever year it was for the Game of Thrones bottle. Um, so yeah, lesser product. Uh, and that's kind of the way it is, right? Like what we're talking about, we're talking about these gimmicky whiskeys where the, the whiskey is not as good because they're using other methods to sell it to you. Yeah, it's very rare you're going to get something that like delivers in quality when it has some sort of backing. I, like we did see some gems, right? Like we, we talked about Highland Park. They usually bang out gems despite their gimmicky nature. You know, the full volume was, you know, cranked to 11, right. you know, all that other stuff. Um, you had the Glenn Dronick uh, Kingsman, which mm -hmm. was based from the movie Kingsman, which was excellent. You had the, Actually, one of the best Johnny Walkers, which was the Johnny Walker Blade Runner. Um, mm. A lot of people love that expression. Yeah. So that's another gimmicky one that probably helped sales and probably helped collectability. But the the whiskey actually actually delivered in that case. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but then you get guys like Conor McGregor backing a whiskey like Proper 12. And sure. literally, if Conor McGregor is not backing Proper 12, I don't think they would have ever sold a bottle like like no. really who, who would care about proper 12 nobody yeah and i mean there's been lots of reviews of proper 12 i reviewed it it's uh pretty garbage um the price point is low mm -hmm. so i mean if you buy it and you hate it i guess you can mix it or whatever it's not going to break the bank but yeah i mean what is that that's really young bushmill whiskey um you know tired casks it's very uh, spirit driven very youthful um something that they can produce obviously super cheap and use the conor mcgregor name to uh, to push it out there so proper 12 uh conor mcgregor just sold his portion which was i can't remember exactly how much what the percentage was but he sold his portion of proper 12 for 600 million dollars wow Six hundred million dollars distilleries sell for that much money. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah, I mean, but who's I guess buying you gotta, whiskey now? Like now that Connor is not associated with it, do you think they're going to continue sales? Like whoever made that purchase is a moron, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he's. It, does he? Is he staying on as like to rep it or no? Mm. So if he continues to be the face, maybe. Right. But like we're talking. I don't know. I mean. I know the Irish love him and I know there's a lot of UFC fans out there that still love him, but we're talking about a guy that, I mean, he destroyed his own career. He's had more losses than wins in the last, I don't know, 10 fights or something like that. So right. really to get like, to blow up a whiskey as much as he did. And then to go out when he's near the end of his like reign and people are starting to find him irrelevant in the sport. Yeah spend 600 million dollars on a whiskey that's garbage just to have i don't know i think that was such a big mistake but we'll see time will tell <laughs> well let's talk about other celebrity whiskeys um one that pops to mind is is a review that got your channel uh, a <laughs> kickstart the virginia black um yeah. our boy uh drake from the six uh his his whiskey that's um, right so this is one that um i didn't think was very good um, apparently it's, it's MGP product, but I'm not sure if that's confirmed or not. 40% ABV, um, the oak profile in it, I, I don't like at all. Is it 40 or 45? 40%. Is it 40%? Yeah. I, I remember liking it. Um, I obviously had a bias because I named my channel after the nickname that the Purdue, the guy backing that whiskey 
gave to Toronto? Like, I don't think, I think he was the first to call Toronto the six, right? Uh, if he wasn't the first, he was the one who popularized it for sure. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So Whiskey in the Six became Whiskey in the Six because that was the trending name for Toronto at the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, not so much. I mean, people still refer to it as the Six, but a lot less so. Um, a lot less so, yeah. I think that the the Drake flavor has gone a little stale in a lot of people's opinion. I mean, he's still obviously a huge recording artist and whatever, but um, yeah, yeah, some people remember him as wheels from Degrassi and some people remember him as the, you know, the hip hop uh, sensation that he is. Yeah. I mean, um, his, his affiliation with the Raptors definitely like kept the six idea going for a while, but I mean, yeah. So they still market it through the Raptors using the six. And, yeah. You know. So Drake, um, I don't know if they call him like a brand ambassador or some kind of ambassador for the yeah, Raptors. He is, yeah. um, you always see him yelling at players sitting courtside uh <laughs> acting a fool um but yeah so the six if you don't know uh six major neighborhoods in toronto is how they get the name the six yeah the six boroughs right um then you have the matthew mcconaughey collaboration with wild turkey the long branch right the long branch you reviewed that one i don't think i've ever i don't think i reviewed it i think i tried it and it was just okay in my opinion yeah it's just okay it's decent stuff nothing that's gonna blow your mind but i mean for the price considering what you get in ontario it's it's about right there with like your buffalo trace and and that sort of stuff it's good uh, yeah I so i think that was uh what uh eight years old i don't know if there's an age statement or not but i think it was rumored at eight years old 43 percent I believe with that one. So a little late. Five, yeah. So that yeah. Uh, 44. Um, but yeah, lots of different celebrity endorsed whiskeys. Do you know that Marilyn Manson has an absinthe that he I put out? I know that <laughs> I know that Metallica has a whiskey. I didn't know that Marilyn Manson has an absinthe. Yeah, Marilyn Manson has a absinthe called Mansinth. <laughs> wow. Apparently it's good and really hard to find. Um, that just sounds awful. <laughs> Bob Dylan has uh, a, a bourbon called Heaven's Door. It's actually at the LCBO I've seen. It is, yeah. I did see it there not too long ago. Um, uh, Peyton Manning in a group of investors um, put out a bourbon called um, uh, Sweeten's Cove. It was a 13-year-old source. I'm not sure where it's from. The story behind it is kind of cool. It's a, it's a, There's this tradition at this really like... Uh, not elite, but kind of this hole in the wall golf course. It's like this pristine, amazing golf course. It's only nine holes. There's no clubhouse. It's just like a trailer. So I don't know where it is, maybe like South Carolina or something like that. Um, and there's a tradition where before you start the round, everyone does like a shot of whiskey or something like that. Okay, um, cool. And it attracts golfers from everywhere. Big celebrities love to play this course. Apparently it's super amazing. Um, so they kind of did this whiskey in kind of tribute to that. Uh, I haven't tried it. Um, I think that it's Bourbon Night reviewed it. I'm not sure. I have to double check that. If they did, I'll throw a link. Um, but it's a 13-year-old Tennessee whiskey. Um, so yeah, interesting to see how that would compare. It's bottled at 50.5% ABV or something like that. That sounds great. 50 50% 13-year-old Tennessee whiskey. I, that sounds like something right up my alley. I would like that. Yeah, so um, another big celebrity-backed uh, product. You look at the George Clooney tequila. I mean, how much did that thing sell for? Uh, you know what? Um, recently, I don't know if you saw the video, but I, I did the review on the um, the Rock. The oh, Rock right, the Rock's tequila, yeah. Paramana. Uh, you know what? I'm proud of him, though, because that bottle is 55 bucks, which in its class, you're looking at, well, Canadian anyway, you're looking at a lot more. Class Azul is over 220 bucks now in Ontario, mm -hmm. which, which actually is like bleeding into the rest of the provinces because it looks like Class Azul is going to be that much across all of Canada. I'm not sure what it goes for in the US, but, um, and that's the Reposado. So 220 for that, you're getting the Terramana, which doesn't have added sugar, doesn't have any additives, and it says it right on the bottle. Um, it, it was very rock like rock style, you know what I mean? Like he he cares a lot about health and all these different things, and he's putting out a pure product, which I thought was really cool. There you go. 
and 55 bucks. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you're getting a very reasonable price on that too. So. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the, I think the Peyton Manning whiskey is, is super expensive. Um, so yeah, I guess when you have a, a gimmicky product, uh, the price points very crucial because I mean, if it's not good, you know, like the proper 12 it's, it wasn't good, but at least you're not paying a lot of money for it, you know? Yeah. Um, when I first started the channel, a buddy of mine, my buddy, Mike, he bought me a bottle of the trailer park boys whiskey. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, liquor, what's it called? Old dirty something, Old dirty liquor or something. Yeah. How was that? It, it was not good. It was not good. Um, I reviewed it just because, but it wasn't a good whiskey. I think I gave it like in the seventies. Yeah. Um, but cheap. So, I mean, you're not, you're not over paying for it and a lot of the thing is these these are all designed to get the fans that back that show that back that person that back that you know whatever it is to buy that product you know yeah. what i mean so it half of those people probably don't even open those bottles because they might not even be whiskey drinkers or tequila drinkers or whatever they just want yeah that's a good point i mean nope. think of many uh non-whiskey drinkers probably bought the game of thrones set just to have it you know hmm. i mean um, the, the the johnny walker fire and ice or whatever it was uh they were pretty bottles like they they were nice looking bottles you had the wolf on the one the dragon on the other yeah they're, you know, they're nice looking i never bought those ones i still have a white walker in my freezer it's like buried at the bottom of my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> um i reviewed that that was like terrible whiskey so i mean i don't know yeah so um, funny story about the cake here yeah um our buddy mark from liquor lodge uh was proposed this bottle uh maybe we gotta bleep out uh the name of <laughs> a, a friend a retail friend um in alberta was offered this bottle a case of this bottle so a case of the Glen Warrenji cake but in order to get this bottle he had to buy 10 cases of like Glen Warrenji 10 or something right. like that like something basic that's going to sit on his shelf for months if not years um in order to get a case of this stuff right. now i'm tasting it right now it's decent but i think i might even like the the 10, the 12, the 14 better than this. Mm -hmm. I'm actually pretty sure I do. So to pay any extra for this is a mistake. I'm talking even just retail. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, uh, this bottle, very popular on the secondary market, not fetching huge prices, um, but definitely, you know, 50% more than retail. I paid 165 Canadian for this. Um, so secondary price. If you look at the UK auctions, you know, they're selling for around uh, 90 to 100 pounds, which is about 20 or 30 pounds over retail over there. Um, so, yeah, definitely people are trying to get their hands on it. Um, we should talk about, it, though, like, what are you getting nose and palate on this bad boy? So on the nose, I get like a little bit of like a piney note. Um, very mild, but like it's masked with like a little bit of like a syrupy note, vanilla as well. Yeah, this thing, um, it doesn't necessarily read like cake to me. Like when I think about cake flavor, I'm kind of pushed towards like what a cake like donut is. Like here in Canada, we have the Tim Hortons like cake, birthday cake, uh, Timbits. That's what I'm like thinking of. It's kind of like that vanilla icing uh, yeah. note. I do get a little bit of like icing sugar kind of sweetness on the nose and on the palate with this, but it doesn't necessarily read birthday cake like the artificial birthday cake flavor that i'd expect right i agree i don't i don't i get like i said a little bit of vanilla i'm not necessarily getting and it, like the nose is not like there's not a big nose on this like you're getting very mild notes here it's very mild it's it's very glenn morangy style uh you know it's uh non age statement i mean you can look at the color in this um you know it's very very clear you can tell that things definitely been chill filtered in my opinion added color perhaps as well yeah. um it's it, it drinks very thin i think like the the finish very thin uh very blended out that's like a term that i use when something's very constructed um 
Yeah. And it, it, it's, it tastes youthful to me. There is a little bit of like youthfulness, not necessarily like a harsh alcohol, mm -hmm. but uh, you can tell that this thing hasn't been aged for very long, in my opinion. Which is funny because usually these special editions from Glenn Morangy, the consensus is, is that they're taking the 10 year old, the basic 10 year old that's just been brought up in ex bourbon cask, and then they move it to whatever cask they're finishing it uh, in for the special releases. Mm -hmm. So it's, it should be X amount of time older than 10 years old, right? But I'm not getting that here. You're right. Like I get a little bit of heat on this and it's only 46% and it's probably chill filtered. Yeah. Maybe not, maybe it's not chill filtered, but you do get a good amount of heat on this. Um, the finish is not very long. The, the sweetness is there, but it goes away quick. It's not a bad whiskey by any means. Like I don't like I'm not disgusted by it by any means. I think it's actually pretty decent. It's a decent like op night opener or you know like to start off your palate. Although the heat might deter like or get in the way of tasting properly later on in the night. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a disappointment for me. Um, I was hoping for a little bit more out of this. Um, and I'll get to scoring it at the end of the episode. But um, was it like you expected more? I did expect more. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, at first, I was like, it's going to be shit. Mm -hmm. Then there are some reviews that came out, some whiskey tubers saying that they liked it. Uh, I don't know why I trusted their opinion, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm, I was disappointed because I was thinking, okay, it's, I had hopes. That's why I purchased it. I mean, I purchased it essentially to do this episode. I, I wanted to know what this thing was going to be about. Yeah. Uh, you know, otherwise I would never have bought this bottle. Yeah. Uh, that retailer that I was telling you the story about earlier, when he asked me what he should do, he wondered if, if you know, is there is there that much hype around this that he should buy that case and and get a whole bunch of other whiskey that he can't sell? Right. And I'm like, don't do it, man. I'm like, who cares? Like, we're gonna get twelve bottles of a of a bottle that's 175 bucks or how much was this? Um, so I paid 165. Um, so I've seen these go for more than that, upwards of almost 200 Canadian. Yeah. Um, like I said, retail price the UK. 75 pounds, secondary UK, 95-ish or so. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, I don't know. I deterred him from getting it, so he, he actually listened. But I don't know. I didn't have high expectations for it because I've been disappointed by Glenn Morangy on these kinds of, like the Milshan or the Milshan, you yeah. know. Um, some of their other special editions I've been disappointed in. Anything that's not Oloroso, uh, PX and port. I have a hard time getting like behind, even like I prefer a next bourbon cask to, uh, you know, uh, Saunter or Saunters, however that's pronounced, mm -hmm. or, or like a Madeira. I, f I find that those wine influences don't really have a lot of influence on the whiskey. I find that like a rum cask will have way more influence on a whiskey than a wine like this. Like, yeah. These these tok tokai casks or whatever they're however it's pronounced from Hungary, you you wouldn't be able to like I wouldn't be able to peg that I wouldn't be like yeah this is definitely a wine cask of some sort like right I yeah I mean I reviewed the Glen Morangy Signet before I probably have the lowest score of anyone who's reviewed that bottle before around I think I scored it eighty five. What did so, I score? Because I scored it pretty low too. And it was on my overrated overpriced whiskeys as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that whiskey, you'll notice a huge price difference between markets uh, here in Ontario. I think they want 300. Yeah. Something, like that. something like that. Other markets you can, you know, in the U S you can find it for, you know, 130. Uh, yeah. Like heard, five yeah. US, something like that. Yeah. I still get comments about that. Cause that was the first overrated overpriced video that I did, I think. And that's like four and a half years ago. And I still get comments about people saying, what, how are you paying that much? It's only 120 bucks or 130 mm -hmm. bucks in this area. So a lot yeah. of people get really upset about the way I scored that whiskey because they really love it. Like there's a whole bunch of people. Yeah. That love people do. People do really love that whiskey quite a bit. Um, 
but yeah, it, it just it's the it's the Glen Warranty profile for me. It's just not a distillery that I necessarily uh, like that much. So yeah, I'm with you. Okay, so next segment we're gonna be talking about what what's happening in Whiskey Tube. Uh, recently, you did a pretty funny video uh, about <laughs> what's happening in Whiskey Tube. I I think it it's important to talk about this because. I find that there's a big difference between the scotch heavy reviewers and the bourbon heavy reviewers. So like all of us dabble in different things. You and I will, we'll drink, we'll review bourbon. We'll review Canadian whiskey. We'll review Irish and, and Japanese or whatever. Right. Yeah. We predominantly review scotch. Um, the bourbon guys will do that too. Like you got mash and drum, Jason, he he's reviewing some scotch once in a while. And he like, you know, um, whiskey central she's Shayla's doing some scotch once in a while as well. Uh, but these guys are bourbon centered. Like that's the basis of their channel. So I believe, I don't know. I think it started with these bourbon channels, right? Um, this, you only need five whiskeys yeah so it was a reddit post and it was it got very popular on reddit and someone was like you only need to have five whiskeys open at once or you only need to have five whiskeys and essentially the criteria something like you need a mixer you need something that's like uh, an easy drinker something uh like a, a bottle to like pull out on a special occasion you know something that you can give to your friends that's you know mediocre something like that yeah um and yeah these bourbon channels and a lot of other channels they all ran with it um because they got huge views like these videos were getting people crazy crazy views um so a lot of people uh, got on board and you know they picked their five or whatever um and then yeah shayla from whiskey central um called out a bunch of channels including mine and yeah, uh, then cool. emailed me and said you know you want to do this yeah and I was like, yeah, it's been done to death. Um, you know, uh, um, Matt from um, ADHD Whiskey put his own kind of twist on it where he kind of redid the categories. So I'm yeah, like, yeah. all right, you know what? I'll, I'll do it, but I'll do it with like a twist and I'll do it kind of like in a parody style because I've seen enough of these and I don't think anyone needs another list of five whiskeys that have been talked about before and before. Um, so did it kind of like in a jokingly way, making fun of people that, that do them all the time. Uh, yeah, people liked it. I mean, I guess, I, am I drawing a line in the sand between Scotch channels and bourbon channels? I don't know. Like, I think it's just all in good fun. Some people take offense um, to, to some of my recent videos, uh, kind of making fun of these bourbon channels. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I thought it was hilarious. Um, lots of people found it funny. Yeah, I, if you look at the comments, people could tell it was all in good fun. Um, I mean, I thought it was hilarious. I, you know what? There's never been this kind of like, well, first of all, the the OGs of Whiskey Tube were all Scotch channels, right? Right. They were all Scotch channels. So like the birth of the bourbon channel who would you say is the first? I guess that that's got to be Jason from the Mash and Drum. Uh, I mean, it's yeah, first like super popular one. I mean, I remember watching bourbon guys like Jason Pyle way back in the day who that's the guy that reviewed on his pool table. And he was buying, you know, Pappy Van Winkle on the shelf for 100 yeah. bucks a bottle or it's 80 bucks a bottle and being like, you know, it's good for the price. And that was, you know, over 10 years ago crazy um so yeah, yeah there's liquor lots of hound liquor hound did a lot of bourbon over the years yeah liquor hound another og but yeah it's, it's if you're looking at like the new uh group of whiskey tubers uh, bourbon central stuff yeah maybe jason mash and drum was the so, first to kind of accelerate um his viewership yeah now i think the whiskey to tu whiskey tube has been has been divided this has nothing to do with you i think it has to do with just the climate um, bourbon boom has a lot to do with it, yeah. but the people that watch the OGs of whiskey were whiskey geeks. They, they studied whiskey. They wanted to know which whiskey they should buy. It was a, it wasn't even like, you know, there was people that I would watch that I didn't necessarily 
like find entertaining, but I would watch them because I cared about what they had to say about that whiskey. Cause I wanted mm. to know if I should go out and buy that whiskey. You know what I mean? That was the whole purpose of whiskey too, back in the day. So a lot yeah. of people created their channels centered around that, right? Like it was about what, okay, what does this guy have to say about the whiskey? Uh, do I trust this palette? If I do, what, what mark is he giving it? Because that's going to affect whether or not I'm going to go buy that whiskey. Right. Uh, and you, you watch a couple of reviews, hopefully if they exist, on that whiskey and then you go make your decision now it's very entertainment based especially the bourbon side of things you have it's like completely different than how like a guy like ralphie for example started off people just watch ralphie because they loved what he had to say about whiskey not necessarily because of the production because he just puts on the camera and talks you know what i mean like there wasn't the flashy lights and all that other stuff that really started with these bourbon channels i think right yeah i think that you know you look at all this like b-roll is being shot now and it's just whiskey tube was great because just the pure substance and the pure quality content of what someone's opinion was their knowledge about whiskey and you're right nowadays it's more about you know two guys acting like idiots uh you know and now i'm i gotta watch a video about bourbon and you know be sold some face cream at the same time or <laughs> uh, a mini fridge and you know it's just like what happened here this is this is the new uh the new way that the whiskey tube's going and i i like the old channels i like this the, the pure content of like yeah. a ralphie who like this is my opinion about something and it's interesting, I think, to find right. that out. Yeah, I mean, there's a place for both. It's, it's, we're not the same though, right? Like we're not, we're being lumped into the same category. Like this, this term whiskey tube was coined a long time ago, but we're not the same. I think there should be two different things here. Cause what, like one is, you know, based on the whiskey, the other one is based on the guy's in front of that whiskey right so or mm -hmm. you know uh, it's about the guys not necessarily about the whiskey like it doesn't matter what um whiskey tribe reviews people are going to watch them anyway because they love them they love their entertainment value they love all that stuff right so they like they can review a whiskey from bangladesh that no one's ever heard of and people are there's going to be 20,000 views on that video if not more you know what i mean and and great that's that's awesome for those whiskey companies that are getting that kind of exposure. Um, but it digresses from there. Like you have channels that literally are reviewing stuff for the sake of having a new video, but it has nothing. It just guys want to watch them high pour a whiskey or, right. or talk really close to the mic. Or <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm tuning in to see that, you know, that expensive bottle hit the floor and smash into a million pieces. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's, it, I guess it depends on what you what you want and, and where you're at and, you know, what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, my video um, made fun of I made fun of myself in the video as well. Um, but yeah, it, I thought it was, I thought it was good. And I thought a lot of people appreciate uh, uh, that kind of, that kind of video from, from my channel, which is normally just your straight up classic, you know, yeah. here's my opinion. Here's my score. Here's yeah. what I paid. This is what I think. Yeah. And you know, it's, I'm noticing the effect of bourbon too, because like pretty much any video I used to put out would get relatively the same amount of views, depending on the time of which I was reviewing that whiskey. So, you know, three years ago, it would probably be the first day would be like 500 views or whatever, you know, now it's like roughly a thousand views the first day. If I put, if I put out a scotch video, I'm around that, right? Like I'm around a thousand views a day, uh, like the first day. And then it drops off from there. If I put out a bourbon video now, no one no longer cares what I have to say about bourbon. There's like a very big drop off because yeah. of all these bourbon uh, tube guys out there. Uh, suddenly, if if you're outside of the United States and you're reviewing bourbon, you don't know what you're talking about anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I did a video where I reviewed the entire Pappy line, like the the 15, the 20, the 23. You know that one of those bourbon channels puts out that same video they're getting you know 100 times more views than what i got on it 
500,000 views for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, but it, there's, there's good and bad to it. Um, there's a place for these guys. I just, I don't think it's reviewing whiskey. It's not, they're not, that's not what they're doing. They're having fun with a bunch of, of people and that's great. That's mm -hmm. awesome. You know, it's, it's grown the people watching whiskey tube on YouTube, which is, which is a great thing. Um, but how long will this last? We talked about how long the bourbon bubble will stick around. You are, I see it every day where a guy I knew for the last five years was knocking scotch and only drinking bourbon and now can no longer tolerate bourbon is only drinking scotch. You know what I mean? So the more scotch they're exposed to, the quicker that happens. Yeah. Uh, so how long will this, will this fad last? And really these guys, maybe they'll pivot because their people are watching them for them, not necessarily for what they're reviewing. Right. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's all good for, for the whiskey community. Uh, you know, the more eyes uh, on it, uh, the better, not so much for allocated bottles. Um, That's true. But, um, but as far as the community growing, it's always a good thing for sure. Yep. All right. Um, well, let's score this Glen Um, you want to go first? You want me to go first? So, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit more. Like there has been a little bit of development. I, I had roughly two ounces in this glass. There's still about, you know, three quarters of an ounce left. Um, it's good. It's not horrible. I didn't pay for it. So it makes it a little bit easier for me to enjoy <laughs> than for you. <laughs> um, I get like a decent amount of sweetness, nothing cake like at all. So I don't know where they came up with the name. Mm -hmm feel like they were trying they set out to okay let's let's make a cake with this whiskey i feel like that was the goal and they fell short like they actually they made the name for the whiskey before they actually put the whiskey together and it's not this like it's not cake yeah so there is a story about the director of their whiskey creation uh dr bill um said to find himself um enjoying a upside down pineapple cake his daughter made and then it reminded him of uh the whiskey finish in these casks or something like that okay yeah. i mean i'm not getting that much pineapple i get more pineapple on the glen g10 than i get on this um yeah i i think i would give this like an 81 82 um it's not bad whiskey by any means but i'm not paying north of a hundred dollars for it mm -hmm. and yeah, I don't think it's bad. I think it's decent, but there's way better. I would rather buy the the Glen Morangy 12 twelve uh, sherry or the Glen Morangy fourteen port. I think those yeah. are better. Yeah, I think we're kind of on the same page with this. I think to me, it doesn't necessarily read cake. There is a lot of sweet notes in here. Um, the pineapple note, maybe a little bit. There is some like some definitely some fruitiness to this. Uh, I do get icing sugar, which I guess is the closest thing I would say to like the cake kind of profile. Um, but for me, uh, it's, it's blended out. It's, uh, the finish is, is pretty weak. It's thin on the palate to me. Uh, and I, like I said before, the Glen Morangy profile as a distillery, is not something that necessarily that I gravitate towards. Um, yeah. I don't necessarily love their core range. It's decent stuff, but it's just, it just doesn't see my wallet. I don't, I don't buy that stuff. Cause I just, it's just, there's other stuff that I prefer. Mm -hmm. um, score wise for me on this one, I can't give this an 80. I'm going 79 and a half out of a hundred. And for value, like I said, I paid 165 candy and that's over retail. Um, I got to take off at least two points for that. So I'm going to bring this thing down to uh, what's that? 77 and a half out of a hundred. Nice. So yeah, low score uh, for me on this one, uh, just not worth it in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. It's just, it's just okay. I mean, like I said, me not having to fork up the cash for this makes it a little bit easier to, <laughs> to drink. And keep in mind, this is my first experience with this. I wonder if this will get better with some time. Yeah, and I think that, you know, you could probably make a great cocktail with something like this. Uh, I'm not sure what cocktail that would be, if it's like an old fashioned or maybe something else, but there's some good flavors in this. Um, might have to have some experimentation 
as to what would go best as far as like a whiskey cocktail with this in mind. But I think it would make a hell of a cocktail, of course, super expensive. But uh, at this point for me in this bottle, um, that's probably where it's going to go. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an expensive mixer, but it, the, the ABV will definitely bring up that cocktail for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us. If you like the content on this podcast, you want to support it a bit more, you want to get this earlier than everyone else, check out our Patreons. We're offering uh, just at $1 uh, to start on either of our Patreons. You can get the Whiskey Ram podcast uh, a day earlier than everyone else. So check that out. Lots of other great tiers on there too. If you want samples, um, you know, look at our tiers. We offer, we each offer uh, different uh, levels of getting amazing whiskey that uh, we have in review. So check us out on Patreon. Uh, links are in the description. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us, guys, and have a good one. Cheers. Everyone. Cheers.